Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, we are here at the third appointment uh, with the uh, Innovation Talks of, uh, of Linea Pelle, uh, an initiative that is uh, within uh, the context of uh, uh, a new point of view uh, that has uh, its uh, online version with uh, a series of events that are complementing, uh, uh, in this case, Linea Pelle New York and Linea Pelle London. Uh, this is the third week uh, that we are um, uh, bringing in uh, this initiative. There will be one more week uh, with the innovation talks and one more week again uh, for uh, a new point of view. Um, a new point of view is uh, today we will speak uh, uh, of uh, a very important topic. We will try to understand uh, uh, what will change uh, in, uh, in the future uh, for, for our supply chains and um, if brands uh, will have uh, probably new or different uh, requests. Um, it is my pleasure and I would say also honor to discuss of, uh, these topics with uh, Christine Goulet, who is the head of uh, sustainable innovation at Caring. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Federico Brugnoli, and I am the curator of uh, the Linapel Innovation Square, which will not take place uh, this September, but hopefully will be uh, live again uh, in the February edition of, uh, of the fair. Uh, before starting and going into the discussion, it's my duty to remind you that uh, a new point of view is also a format that will take place physically in Milano uh, on September 22nd and 23rd. Uh, there are already a lot of tanneries who have uh, uh, guaranteed their participation and also uh, other companies. So it's, uh, um, it will be a pleasure also to see you in Milano uh, in, a, in a probably a hopefully better situation from which uh, uh, we are now. So, uh, well, Christine, thank you very much for being here with us. Um, uh, I would just uh, start uh, with you uh, briefly introducing yourself uh, uh, to the audience for the, the few that may not know you already. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks Federico and it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you today. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, so as Federico mentioned, I'm the head of sustainable innovation at Caring. Uh, you probably know Caring, but in a nutshell it's um, uh, a group of luxury brands, both in hard and soft luxury. So our houses include um, Gucci, Saint Laurent, Balenciaga, Bottega Veneta, Brioni. Uh, we also have jewelry and watch brands such as uh, Pamelato, Dodo, Keelan, Ulysse Nardin, Gerard Perigo. So it's a, it's a rich portfolio of brands um, where we deal with many different types of supply chains, obviously, and we're seeing a lot of evolution in that space right now. Um, in particular, as we all know, because of, of the current um, situation in the pandemic that we're, we're all living through. Um, in my role, just to give you a bit more info, I'm really placed sort of at that front of the innovation funnel when it comes to scouting. Um, so I look all across the value chain from alternative raw materials to end of life, whether that be chemical or mechanical recycling or new business models, always with this lens of impact and sustainability. Uh, so I work with uh, partners such as Fashion for Good in Amsterdam, which is an innovation platform with Plug and Play in China, which helps us uh, do scouting there for, for innovations um, in sustainable fashion and uh, work closely with the brands within Caring and also at group level with different departments on trying to understand what the pain points are, uh, what the best technologies are to, to suit those and, and seeing how we can uh, move those through the funnel through testing and piloting. Okay, Christine, thank you very much. Um, I, I am always very honest with, uh, with the audience. So uh, just to say that we have prepared some questions to discuss mm -hmm. about, but um, uh, I may ask you also some, some kind of uh, other information that, that we haven't prepared. There is one that is just got on my mind, but don't worry, <laughs> it's be dangerous. Okay. Um, so the first one that we prepared is, uh, well, we are in a, in a difficult period. Probably uh, the past six months have been the most difficult ever for mm -hmm. many, many brands. But we always want to look ahead. Uh, so what is the impact that you have seen uh, on brands, starting from uh, retail up to the, the overall supply chain uh, uh, organization? If mm -hmm. you can elaborate a little bit on that, please. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, I, you know, I think there will be uh, before and after COVID, but we're still very much in, in the midst of it. Um, so it's hard to be able to make that sort of comparison right now. But from my personal point of view, from, from what I'm seeing right now, there's quite a lot of acceleration um, for a lot of innovations, which were already there. So I, I think there's very little that's completely new. It's sort of like trends that people were beginning to sort of explore or try to implement, but it's this because of what's what's happening, there's an acceleration. It's we have to do it now. So I think that's where supply chains and brands and uh, at the retail level as well are, are um, trying to adjust very quickly um, to how they can select and implement some of the new uh, technologies and solutions. So obviously, um, for many brands, their supply chains were closed for a while. Some still might have their supply chains closed. Distribution centers and warehouses weren't always open during this time. And, and also from the retail side, um, many stores were, have been closed um, in, in all geographies at different points of time. So for all of those reasons, you're seeing the, the adoption of, of digital um, technologies. You know, how can you assure virtual, virtual fit, for example? How can you uh, ramp up your e-commerce capabilities? Because I think most brands have seen quite a jump in e-commerce overall. Um, how, how do you allow people to shop when they can't actually go to the store? So these, these are areas on the retail side that have been um, really booming pretty quickly. And then also uh, within the supply chain, I, I think people are trying to think about how can they make their supply chains more local? How can they produce in a uh, more uh, timely, um, just in time fashion, so they're not stuck with overproduction and shipments that that they can't actually get to their store, their warehouse, or their their customer. So you know, I don't think what I'm saying is really news to anybody. Um, but I guess the point I want to get across is these nuggets had already been planted, and now it's really what's a bit shocking about the the, the time we're in is trying to implement them as quickly as possible. Okay, so basically. Uh... Uh, the, there has been a, uh, COVID as a, as a trigger to, to create an acceleration in some changes. Um, uh, probably uh, from the retail point of view, brands that are global uh, have an advantage uh, with respect to others because, uh, you know, the, the, the geography of the pandemic is moving mm -hmm. and uh, when the pandemic is uh, uh, where the pandemic is uh, slowing down, uh, then uh, sales are starting to get back. But uh, for sure, mm -hmm. um, uh, e-commerce has, uh, has increased in importance. Um, mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and uh, what about the, 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 uh, the reaction more specifically on, on innovation? I'll be, I'll be clearer on this question. So uh, is it true in your opinion that uh, um, yeah, innovation in terms of uh, business organization, retail, e-commerce uh, are growing in, in importance? but probably innovation in terms of uh, um, materials, uh, in terms of uh, R&D on, on processes uh, is a little bit uh, put on the side in this period. Uh, what, is your, what is your opinion on that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I think that you, know, you have different strategies, short, medium, and long term. So sometimes the, the digital or the soft tech innovations are easier to implement in more quickly. You know, uh, if it comes to materials, there's an R&D process that you just can't speed up. You know, um, uh, it can take years and there's nothing you can do to change that. So um, I think what people are, are looking toward now, um, companies and brands are to, to say, what can, I, what can I get off the shelf now and, and put into place? And so just based on how innovations work in hard or soft tech, it, it's more of the, the digital solutions that they're able to put into place in the short term. I don't think that um, means that new materials or, or new processes are um, less important, but they, they might be, I guess, I guess in some ways shifted to the medium or long-term bucket while they're, they're trying to fight the fire of how do we actually uh, get product to people in, in this current space where people aren't going to the stores and people aren't, um, uh, yeah, aren't able to, to do the normal uh, traditional uh, consumer practices that they've been doing for years. So um, that, that would be my point of view on that. Yeah, so it's like uh, there is a, an imminent need of keeping oxygen flowing. Uh, yeah. And then uh, we will see how to improve uh, 
in in general in in the future. Um, Christine, you you touched a couple of points that uh, were very interesting for me uh, with respect to the possible change. We are speaking in general, Christine. We're not speaking about caring, but. Uh, as I, as, I, as I mentioned before, you, you are such an expert that, uh, and I'm sure you have an opinion on that. So uh, in Italy, we, we are kind of thinking that this uh, uh, COVID situation may be the, the moment in which there will be a kind of reshoring of some uh, kind of production, localization of production, mm -hmm. uh, supply chains that are more local. Uh, reducing the risks of uh, uh, you know getting production stopped uh, mm -hmm. uh, because of the same situation uh, uh, across the country. So, do you think that in general this is uh, uh, an impact uh, that will be in on, on supply chains? Also, taking into consideration what we have said about the reaction uh, of uh, of. Uh, of, uh, of brands in terms of e-commerce. So maybe a global market with a more local supply chain solutions. Is that something that uh, in your yeah. opinion is uh, something that will happen? It, yes, uh, it seems to be uh, one of the big um, uh, trends that you're seeing emerging, you know, when you're reading at a, a different newsletters as, as I scan headlines. I mean, that's coming up over and over again. How do you localize? And again, this isn't necessarily new but it's risen in the priority levels. I think, you know, we've been seeing different innovations through Fashion for Good or other platforms. We're part of the Lafayette uh, plug and play uh, retail platform in Paris. We're, we're, we're seeing some of these solutions coming up on how you could change your production to be more local or uh, just in time, et cetera. So again, it's this, okay, we know this has been brewing in the background, but how do we accelerate on this now? And, and, you know, it, I think it kind of goes hand in hand with uh, another subject, which is getting more important for, for brands uh, in general, is traceability. And, you know, cu customers want this reassurance that the products that they're buying are made well and are coming from the right provenances. Um, and brands want to be able to do that, too, and be able to ensure that they're... Uh, not taking on risk that they shouldn't be in the way that they're sourcing and producing. So um, as you know, within Caring, we have a, an objective to have 100% of our key raw materials traceable to the sort of the tier four producer level. So for leather, it would be that, that uh, um, uh, rearing level the, uh, of the, the cattle farm. Um, this is quite challenging and the more, um, the more anonymous or diverse or spread out your supply chain is, the more difficult it is obviously to establish this traceability as well. And so I think what we're seeing in addition to um, this uh, focus on trying to localize your supply chain are more and more platforms coming up that will be able to give you that, that traceability of the different players that, that are producing your goods all the way back up to that, that farm level in many circumstances and using a lot of, you know, whether it be uh, blockchain and, and um, tokenizing the, the, the fibers or the, the goods as they're going through your, process, your supply chain process. So this prolifer proliferation of different um, tech technologies and software systems to overlay your supply chain is, um, is something that we're seeing more and more of, which also means on the supplier side, the need to uh, adapt to, to some new um, software platforms, but potentially also uh, um, be more transparent in the way the, they're running their supply chains too. Uh, so that's, I think, gonna be quite interesting to see as uh, this journey moves forward as well. Um, one, one of the questions that we haven't prepared, uh, isn't the, the hyper proliferation of different platform something that may create confusion or uh, a lot of uh, effort the supply chain um, yeah. uh, we are having also this big debate on on sustainability which i will touch later on so that mm -hmm. many different brands uh, have their own interpretation of uh, of sustainability as well as many different brands may decide to opt for a technological platform or or the other so uh, harmonization is is a key when we are speaking about global supply chains right yeah oh for sure i completely agree so you know 
um, yes, it's gonna, <laughs> I think uh, it's gonna be something to uh, prioritize within industry groups based around certain supply chains to make sure that we're, we're uh, trying to focus on certain platforms um, so that we aren't building up too much work uh, for suppliers because otherwise um, people spend all their time going on different platforms and, and that's not the objective either. So, exactly. yes, exactly. for sure. Yep. Even if uh, I, I also do recognize the, the importance of, uh, of traceability from uh, raw materials to finished product, when we were speaking about uh, localization, it is also uh, really, uh, uh, I would say really true, but even if it's not really a correct English, um, that uh, that reduces a lot the risk of running into non-sustainable practices mm -hmm. for the parts of the of the supply chain that are let's say uh, localized, uh, reshored, or in in a, at the level of proximity. Um, uh, but as well, uh, uh, the, the the challenge of uh, tracing back the material up to tier four goes together with the challenge of then identifying the means for a proper verification up to tier, tier four. So uh, I, I, the, the objectives of caring were very clear to me, as you know, we work with some of your, of your brands, but uh, it's, it's really challenging and it's really ambitious and uh, it's, it's really good that you're trying to do it. Um, uh, Christine, which are then, in your opinion, let's say the most important opportunities and threats for the representatives of the supply chain, I would say tier one and tier two suppliers uh, in, uh, in, in these evolving situations? Uh, well, I'm probably biased because I, I'm in the sustainability department, but I think, uh, <laughs> you know, embracing um, the, the practices around sustainability are, are going to be key competitive advantages for a lot of suppliers. Um, you know, the, the traceability piece, you know, depending on the supply chain, it could be uh, ensuring animal welfare, um, uh, could be making sure you're becoming certified uh, for certain um, fabrics, uh, fibers. So I, I think there's real opportunity there. You know, I've, I've been working in sustainability for over 10 years. And really in the last few years, you just see this, this um, massive See change that it's finally mainstreaming as as everybody knows I guess because they see it uh, all over the the news and everywhere um, so uh, really uh, yeah adopting some of the practices and being an early adopter of some of these um, important issues within um, your your supply chain practices and business will probably set you up um, pretty well because brands across the board are, are looking at these these issues and, and want them to be um, addressed, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. And, okay, so these are the opportunities and what about the threats? Well, yeah, conversely, a threat is, is uh, probably um, not doing that, <laughs> I would say. Um, I think a lot of the, the threats of, uh, have, have come out during the, the pandemic in many ways as we've seen um, things shut down overall, uh, you see where your uh, risk, where you're open to risk uh, more, more now than ever. Um, so for different suppliers that could vary, but um, uh, I think it shines, shines quite a light on, on where you need to uh, look at your business practices. And, and I, I think that's one of the um, silver linings in a way of the situation is that it's making all brands, suppliers, companies across the board really look at the way that they're doing business overall. I mean, nothing sort of off the table here. You're really looking across the spectrum of your practices to try to understand uh, what you need to get rid of and where you need to uh, bolster and, and boost up your, your resources or your, your efforts. Um, so I bet each of in, in suppliers who, who are uh, uh, on this webinar could probably highlight their threats pretty uh, specifically at this point in time. Um, uh, a little elaboration on my side, uh, I, I see the opportunity of increasing quality overall um, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, of production. Um, I, I personally have the opinion and I would like to see or to understand if you, if you agree with what I'm saying 
that uh, probably the high-end uh, durable and quality products uh, will have a better market in the future rather than um, mass-produced uh, uh, fast fashion products for two reasons. Mm -hmm. The first one being uh, that uh, the, the economic uh, uh, situation is worse for the kind of level of consumers that are normally buying uh, fast fashion. So those uh, that, that probably lost their job were the ones that had uh, uh, lower jobs, I would say. So that the capacity of expenditure will, will be in a medium higher level than, uh, than, uh, than in the past. And, uh, um, and this being uh, the number one reason. Uh, and number two is also uh, the, 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 probably the psychological situation for which people want to have something beautiful now uh, after mm -hmm. a very difficult period. So I, I don't know, yeah. it, it's something that you share with me. Yeah, yeah, no, I think those are both great points. And, and also on the quality side with product durability, you know, we're, we're seeing um, the, the birth and growth of this whole resale market, you know, the rental and resale, um, where the higher quality products are often better suited to that, that market than, than fast fashion because um, you, they're gonna last longer, so it makes it possible to sell them again or to continue to rent them. So that's a whole other avenue uh, that's a business opportunity for many, as well as, as um, a sustainability opportunity. And it, it will depend quite a bit on the quality of the products that go into circulation in that, in that secondary market. Uh, so for sure. And I, you know, I think another area that to highlight, we touched upon it briefly, but this being able to produce more um, uh, efficiently and you know, using just-in-time uh, processes so that you're not overproducing, uh, that's, that's a huge issue at the moment, uh, of course. We, brands all around are looking, and, and especially with what's been happening in the inability for, inability for retail stores to sell the, the inventory that they have right now. Uh, there's, I think, suppliers who are able to manage that better, uh, you know, lo uh, lowering lead times, producing more on-demand, uh, will also be a, in a great uh, space and have a competitive advantage as well. Yeah, there was another point that I was about to touch uh, that, is, that mm -hmm. goes, goes together with a trend that I'm seeing that is the increasing importance of made to measure, uh, mm -hmm. not only in brands, but uh, also in, uh, in um, mid to high level uh, smaller companies. And mm -hmm. this exactly leads to uh, the need for just in time uh, uh, neutralization of product uh, very down in the, in the production process. Yeah. So just uh, for the audience, uh, we will uh, soon open uh, after the, my last question to, to Christine, a Q&A session. You are then, um, uh, from now on, you can just type some questions and we will try to, to answer them. So, and my last question to you, Christine, is will the fashion industry be more uh, or less sustainable in the future? So we, we um, is, is this COVID uh, triggering a, 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 an increased importance of sustainability or is rather a topic that is still there, but probably not as priority as, uh, as it was in the past? Um, that's, a, that's a great question, Federico. Um, I personally think it's going to make things more sustainable because as we uh, talk about some of these big trends, um, local manufacturing or producing on demand just in time, you know, the, the impact is going to be better for the environment. Uh, or I'll put in the uh, caveat that we think so. And that leads to something that I think is really important, which is data. We need to have the right data and be collecting the right data as we're making these transitions to new uh, solutions, um, like digital solutions. We're seeing a lot with fashion weeks right now, the virtual fashion weeks or virtual showrooms. We, we actually need to calculate what these impacts are and to be collecting uh, the right data during the testing and the piloting and the adoption of these technologies to really say for sure whether we are more sustainable. You know, I, I think we have this general idea that doing a digital fashion week is going to be better because we won't have people flying in and we won't have all these physical events. But, um, but how much of uh, that footprint will be counteracted by the fact that you're going to have hundreds of thousands more people potentially accessing this and live streaming heavy videos. Uh, um, so there, there's a lot of work to be done on, on the data side to ensure that the, the decisions we're making in terms of innovation are really leading us toward a more sustainable 
fashion and apparel sector. Well, Christine, thank you very much uh, for for your time. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let uh, the audience, uh, I, I, I see like 10, 15 seconds. Uh, and if uh, we don't uh, receive any, any question, uh, we will uh, we will start our evening. So uh, <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in brief, to add on to what you were saying, I have uh, also an idea that more topics will come in under the, under the global concept of, uh, of sustainability. There will be new behaviors in the supply chain. I have uh, identified a term that is uh, supply chain solidarity. So in these mm -hmm. difficult periods, uh, there will be maybe stricter uh, links uh, between uh, suppliers and, and customers. Uh, we have seen also um, very good initiatives of, uh, of big players uh, on the customer side that were anticipating payments, for example. So just mm -hmm. to keep mm -hmm. the oxygen flowing, as, uh, mm -hmm. as we were mm -hmm. saying. And I do mm -hmm. see this uh, under the, the big, the big, uh, uh, the big word sustainability as well. Yes, yes. Yeah, you're right. Mm. Yeah. So, Christine, I think no, no questions raised. I, I really thank you okay. for your participation and just remind the audience that we will have, uh, oh, just one coming in. So, an uh, opinion upcycling. about upcycling in fashion. Mm -hmm. Great. So, this would be sort of taking existing product that uh, if you could clarify a little bit exactly what you mean by upcycling, do you mean taking existing product that hasn't been sold and trying to do something with it or, or with I think so, yes. I think this yes? is the meaning, yes. Yeah, okay. So, so yeah, I mean, I think upcycling is great. Uh, what I, I think one of the main challenges of upcycling or repurposing, I guess, uh, if you take uh, garments, um, there, there are a few different challenges, but, but one of them is scalability. It's really difficult to find a way to... Um, upcycle on on a mass basis you know you can do capsule collections and uh, come out with a limited number of products that you're upcycling but it takes quite a lot of work to be able to do that with garments so you, you often mostly see downcycling um, you know uh, things that are um, mechanically recycled or broken down to become insulation or um, create you know mixed with a binder to become carpet or something like this so so I think we see on, on a broad scale, much more downcycling than upcycling, um, but more, so more solutions in the upcycling space are definitely needed um, that can be implemented in, a, in an easier and broader uh, way. I see there are a number of other questions coming in now. Yeah, okay. I was just about to close and then they started. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Roberto Procaccini asking, uh, do you think that the cost of production will increase and supply suppliers will be very paid better? Or what? That's a, a kind of a tricky Yeah, <laughs> that's a tricky one. I really, I really uh, don't know on that one, uh, Roberto. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think there are some parts that... Um, it's going to be more expensive, obviously, if there's new equipment that needs to be put in place as some of these new innovations come to light. There are mechanisms in place, like there's one, I mentioned Fashion for Good, but they have a good fashion fund to help suppliers to implement some of these new, um, uh, some of the new infrastructure. And there are, there are other mechanisms and funds that help with that sort of thing. So uh, yeah, there's, there's the cost of production, which will probably increase in some ways. Um, also, we, I, you know, we know that certifications can be more costly uh, and that often brands are paying more for certified materials, for example. So we'll, we'll have to see. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's going to be just the initial investment. And then over time, hopefully, you're, you're, you're going to uh, hit a break even on that investment and then, then it can lower your costs. But it's kind of a broad question to, to be able to address. So um, uh, really, it's really difficult to predict uh, somehow, uh, Christine. But uh, Thais Deus uh, is uh, asking also an interesting question, uh, and we have seen some trends already, you know, about uh, the, the scheduling uh, and, and the seasonality, I would say. We, we got mm -hmm. to a point in which there were 10 main events uh, per, per year, so uh, do you, we have uh, also seen uh, Gucci, for example, that is doing something uh, in, in the opposite direction. So, uh, yeah. what's your opinion on that? 
Yeah, no, I think that's a really exciting sort of uh, movement we're seeing. So Gucci, as, as you mentioned, Federico has announced they're only going to do two, two shows per year um, and they're going to be seasonless. So it's very different from the, the hectic, uh, very rhythmic schedule that, that they were adhering to before. Also in 2020, Saint Laurent said that they weren't going to be following the traditional fashion calendar. Um, so those are just within caring, but I think there, there are a number of designers and um, industry players who are looking at the fashion calendar and, and calling, uh, making a call to action that we, the industry as a whole should be looking at it and trying to reduce the number of shows or uh, you know, streamline and be be a bit smarter about how how um, different brands are showing. So that's definitely one of the uh, the fallouts or one of the uh, um, consequences consequences or outcomes from from the pandemic. Yes, we'll have to see. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned digital as well, but what's going to happen with the digital and and uh, versus physical and and this sort of hybrid way of showing. Um, you know, I don't, I, now that digital has really entered the fashion weeks, I, I don't think it will ever really go away, but how will it be um, merged with, with the physical world? So uh, I, I think we're going to see a lot of exciting changes over the, the coming uh, couple of years in particular to see where things sort of settle out in terms of fashion calendar, the way people are showing their collections, et cetera. Very, very interesting uh, to, to speak with you as always, uh, Christine. Oh, so, well, thank you, uh, thanks. <laughs> no, it's, it's, really, it's really a pleasure. So our next meeting will be um, August 5th, same time, 6 p.m. Um, and I hope to be uh, uh, in, in company of, uh, of uh, many people in the audience. Uh, Christine, thank you very much, uh, one more it's time. Very cool. And uh, well, have a good summer if uh, we don't hear each other before September. Thank okay, you thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.